as always, I'm thankful for this opportunity and privilege to stand before you and deliver a lesson from God's Word. If you would like to be turning to Isaiah chapter 31, that will serve as our text this morning. But before that, a little bit of a background on that chapter. Isaiah chapter 31 takes place in the late 8th century B.C. During this time, Assyria is the dominant world power. And just as many others, both before and after him, King Shalmaneser was used as God's fleshly instrument to punish the unfaithful children of Israel. Now we can read about these events. They're recorded in 2 Kings chapter 18 and 19, as well as Isaiah chapters 36 and 37. But we see that the northern kingdom of Israel had already been taken captive by Assyria and that the kingdom of Judah was next. As a result, they sought help from Egypt. Thus, Judah was attempting to rely on the Pharaoh of Egypt as their God, rather than El Shaddai, that is, the Almighty God, Exodus chapter 6, verse 3. Rather than returning to God, they, put, they decided to put their stock, their trust, in the fleshly arm of man, in the weapons of war that Egypt had in their possession. So our text this morning, again, that's Isaiah chapter 31, verses 1 through 9. It says, Woe unto them that go down to Egypt for help, and stay on horses, and trust in chariots, because they are many, and in horsemen, because they are very strong. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. Yet he also is wise, and will bring evil, and will not call back his words but will arise against the house of the evildoers and against the help of them that work iniquity. Now the Egyptians are men and not God, and their horses flesh and not spirit. When the Lord shall stretch out his hand, both he that helpeth shall fall, and he that is hoping shall fall down, and they all shall fail together. For thus saith the Lord spoken unto me, Like as the lion and the young lion roaring on his prey, when a multitude of shepherds is called forth against him, he will not be afraid of their voice, nor abase him for their noise of them. So shall the Lord of hosts come down to fight for Mount Zion and for the hill thereof. As birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending also he will deliver it, and passing over he will preserve it. Turn ye unto him from whom the children of Israel have deeply revolted. For in that day every man shall cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which your own hands have made unto you for a sin. Then shall the Assyrian fall with the sword, not of a mighty man, and the sword not of a mean man shall devour him. But he shall flee from the sword, and his young men shall be discomfited. And he shall pass over to his stronghold for fear, and his princes shall be afraid of the ensign saith the Lord, whose fire is in Zion and his furnace in Jerusalem. So this passage in mind, I would like for us to consider this morning the folly of going down to Egypt for help. And as in so doing, we're going to discuss three points. The importance of trusting God, the importance of obeying God, and third, the importance of holiness. So the importance of, of putting our trust in God, our faith in God. As we've just read in Isaiah chapter 31, Israel has failed to do that. But we see this warning that Isaiah is, is presenting. He presses the need for trusting Jehovah. We know from Isaiah chapter 59 verse 1, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. You see, Jehovah God is trustworthy. We can trust that God will keep his promises. Second Peter chapter two verse uh, excuse me, Second Peter chapter three verse nine. And once he makes a promise, he will not 
go back on his word. He will not break his word. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6. <clears throat> Therefore we must remain faithful in order to get benefit from these promises. Psalm chapter 27 verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Paul penned it this way in Romans 8, 31. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Now we see that Israel has a long history of putting its faith in Egypt. They did this shortly after leaving bondage in Exodus chapter 14, verses 11 and 12. They were murmuring against Moses. They were murmuring against God. They were wishing to be sent back to Egypt to enjoy the benefits that they had as slaves. They would rather die in Egypt for the short period of comfort than serve God and endure hardship in the wilderness. And we see from our text this morning that they were returning to that way of life, at least attempting to. They were already lost in that regard, but they were seeking Egypt for help. They looked for Pharaoh for their strength. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 2. Now, God promised, he foretold that this strength of Egypt and the shadow which they sought after would both be a, a shame unto them and confusion respectively. Isaiah 30, verse 3. History shows that Assyria would eventually take Israel captive and bring <laughs> Egypt even to naught. Thus, the prophecy of Isaiah 31, verse 3, was fulfilled. Both aspects. The helper would fall, and the hope in would fall, both Egypt and Israel. It says they would fail together, indeed they did. Are we any different today? Certainly the, the world seeks after fleshly help. We know better than that. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, as well as chapter 16, verse 25. We might look to ourselves, but the best we're going to get, the only conclusion we're going to arrive at looking to ourselves is the ways of death. Now, I can only speak for the last few years. There's, been, there's many who have been alive longer than I have, but we have seen this nation ripped and torn by various problems. You look around us, there's broken homes. The suicide rate is continuing to increase. Then you look at all the teen pregnancy and how that's increased. And you have multiple generations turning to Planned Parenthood as a, as a way of guidance. The individual looks to those in power to solve problems. It's a whole lot easier when I don't have to deal with the problems. We'll just allow somebody else to. We might look to the politicians to save us, to make our lives better. We turn to public education. They can take my kids for eight, nine hours, and I can relax and not have to worry about these little heathens. Forgetting the fact that the responsibility has been placed on the home to train those children up. Now, certainly public education has filled a, a good role, at least it started out being such. But what about today? We might, might also put our faith in the media. All this fact-checking and, and what most people would call fake news. You know, you can go on and on from there. But either way, these different things cause problems in our lives. But we turn to them for some sort of rest. What many fail to realize is that every one of these issues could be solved, would be solved, if we returned to the Word of God. Now, this predicament is summed up very well, I think, in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 15. Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. You might also have heard it this way. If you, you made your bed, now you have to sleep in it. You see, if I choose a difficult path, there are consequences, and that way is hard. It's difficult. But either way, those consequences are a result of the choices I have made. Is spiritual Israel any different today? Wouldn't be the first time that 
we've sought fleshly help. It's not the first time. As individual members and even as a, as a congregation, we can easily be persuaded to follow a perverted gospel if we don't know the true gospel. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. We might look to the man presenting the lesson who's delivering it rather than what he is actually saying. We might consider liberalism, and that's loosing our obligations that God has placed on us. Or antiism, which is binding obligations that God has not bound on us. Either one of these will send your soul to hell. Israel of today, spiritual Israel, can attempt to fellowship with those that are outside of Christ. But what do we mean by that? Some, even many, have had the idea that team, teaming up with the denominations in order to preach the gospel is a good thing. But you see, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, was not given to the denominations. Originally, it was given to the apostles, those who were in a covenant relationship with God. And through their doctrine, this verse applies. You see, the gospel is a, is a seed. The apostles planted, God watered and gave the increase, and each member of the blood-bought body of Christ is obligated to evangelize the world. No denomination is qualified to do that, though they might attempt. There's been certainly a whole host of different missionary journeys in the name of pick your denomination, but all those attempts are in vain. They are simply not qualified to do that work. This work has been given to the church and only the church. Now going along with that, we might even attempt to fellowship with those who have left the faith. Instead of following 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 5 and 6, which reads, To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Instead of that, we're enjoying a common meal together with these people. We're welcoming them into our house as if nothing ever happened. These things ought not so to be. There was a time that the Christian was known as a person of the book. We must return to that book. Trust God. And learn how to rein in our own flesh and even the lusts thereof. Secondly, we see the importance of obeying God's word. In order to receive God's blessing, God's divine blessing, obedience has always been required. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 22 and 23. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 and 14. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 27. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. And Revelation chapter 22, verse 14. You see from our text, Israel was in deep despair due to their outright rejection of God and His word. Rather than returning to God, they attempted to remedy their situation by turning to Egypt, by using their weapons of warfare to defend them. They committed the same folly as Saul of old. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 8 through 14, where he was, Saul was waiting on Samuel to come offer the burnt sacrifice, and he, you know, he took a little bit too long. Sounds like many Americans today. We've got to hurry up and get this done. After all, the people are scattered away from me. But you see, Saul offered that sacrifice himself. He wasn't qualified to do that. And because of that, he was cursed. Israel as a nation became an abomination to God. They substituted evil for good. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 20 through 23. They willfully and high-handedly maintained rebellion against God. Hosea chapter 8, verses 1 through 14. And we see in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, that they were deeply ignorant of the truth found in the law of Moses that was given to them. 
Are we any different as a nation today? You look around, so-called religious leaders hate the concept of a pattern. They attack the Word of God. They attack it. They challenge it from the standpoint of its inspiration. They challenge its inerrancy. They challenge its authority. You see, both the terms pattern and authority are now trigger words. And they shouldn't be, be used at all in religion. You won't find that in your Bible. Many have ignored God's pattern for the home. After all, this is it's where it all starts. Adultery and fornication are running rampant. It's all around us. But you see the pattern. Matthew 19, verses 1 through 12. One woman, one man, for life. We see a lack of willingness to financially support the family. We instead have become a welfare state, completely ignoring 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12. What about our willingness to protect the home and even the sanctity of life? We are to provide for the home. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. We must protect that home. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33. The comparison there is made between Christ dying for the church and the husband being willing to give up his life for his wife. We well, see, part of protecting the home is also protecting those children. Consider how many homes that might go through with what they would call an unplanned parents, uh, an unplanned pregnancy. You know, any man that would allow his child to be aborted is a coward. Just like the woman doing it. Now, I have felt that way for quite some time, but it's much different when you have a little one of your own. It means so much more. The truth there is so much stronger. Nothing but cowards. First off, they shouldn't have been doing the thing that they committed, that fornication, maybe even adultery. But we become cowards as a people, as a nation. And unfortunately, we become cowards in the church. You see, these, and not only these, but many more, these different principles start first being taught in the home. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 14. Instead, we look to public school as the primary teaching agent. And then we look to the church as the secondary teaching agent. Now certainly, public school education might not all be bad. I was teaching there and I saw enough and I wanted to get out. I don't want to go back. And certainly the church is a teaching institution. But it's not taking the place of the home. God's first ordained institution. Mama and daddy have the responsibility of rearing those children correctly. The church is to build on that foundation. You see, it is the word of God that will judge us in that last day. John chapter 12, verse 48. Again, we must return to the book. We must be people of the book. God has laid out the pattern for us to follow. It is up, up to us as individuals and collectively the church to put those things into practice. It is indeed important to follow his word. And third, we consider the importance of holiness. Throughout the history of Israel, they completely decided that they would rather be separate from God and now no longer dedicated to God. But you see in scripture that Israel was specifically chosen to be separate and dedicated to God. They were to be pure in their service to God. They were to manifest His greatness, His goodness, and His righteousness to the world around them. You see, while the world was still under the law of patriarchy, Israel was under the law of Moses. God has never left man without law. But by and large, mankind has rejected God. 
You see, Israel was supposed to be separate from that. They were supposed to be God's influence on the earth. They were supposed to be the leaven for good to the nations around them. But by going to Egypt for help, they endangered this special status. Instead, they became just like those nations around about them in speech, behavior, and even worship. We in the church today can fall into the same trap if, we don't, if we're not careful. Indeed, many have become like those of Samuel's day. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 19 and 20, it says, Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Now going back up to verse 7, the same chapter, says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. You see, the principle of government is God's second ordained institution. Government in and of itself is not sinful. But we see the motivation that the people had to have a king. To be like the nations round about them. Israel already had a government. They were a theocracy. God was their king. And they rejected him. Thus we see the events leading up to Saul's anointment. And becoming king as well as the kings following him. But the motivation was to be, those, to be similar and even the same as those around them. We want a king just like all the other nations. As Americans, how do we fit into that? Again, government is not sinful. Government can certainly be misused and abused. But it's the people involved in that government that corrupt it. The principle itself is pure. After all, it is God ordained. Now those in the church have a different government. Now certainly they are subject to the government which they're under, citizens of the fleshly nation that they're a part of. But children of God are subject to His rule. Now through process of time, through weakness of flesh, it can be said of the child of God that ye are, ye are fallen from grace. Galatians chapter 5 verse 4. God has commanded us to be holy, for God himself is holy. Now, God would not command us to do this if it were impossible for us to actually be holy. So it is not only possible, but expected of us to be holy. 1 Peter chapter 1, 16, Leviticus chapter 11, verses 44 and 45, and Psalm 86, verse 2. Each of these four verses say, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Now that's quite a difficult task, but as we've said, it is not impossible. It is expected of us. It just takes work. This is done by remaining separate from the world around us. Not that we hold up in a cave somewhere and we never get out of that cave or bunker, whatever you want to call it. We don't ever leave that bunker until we need supplies. Or maybe you're even self-sufficient. You, you never even have to leave that reservation. That's not what's being taught here. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 and six through 16. And James chapter 1, verse 27. Particularly James 1, 27 says we're supposed to be unspotted from the world. We're supposed to be separate from that. In the stamp, or from the standpoint of being tainted by the sin thereof. We have to live in this world, but that does not mean we have to be of this world. Jesus said the Christian is salt of the earth. Now, I don't know about you, but if I want salt on my food, I'm not going to dump it out on the, the table and expect to benefit from it. No, the salt has to actually reach the food in order to have that savor added. 
The Christian is also compared to light. We sing with the children. You know, don't hide your little light under a bushel. Where is a light most beneficial? In darkness. Now, certainly light is useful everywhere, but you won't see its full effect till you come in this auditorium and flip a light switch on. Now the room is illuminated. Now you can see where you're going. You won't stub your toe. You see, in this dark world of sin, God has given us His Word, which is a light unto our path. And using that light, not only should we ourselves remain pure and unspotted from the world, but we're supposed to guide others to God using that light so that they in turn can do the same for others. We become holy and maintain our state of holiness by being separate who have left the faith. We read earlier about a little leaven leavening the whole lump. If you allow sin to exist in a congregation, it's just like weeds, just like Johnson grass. You let that grass grow long enough, it's going to take over your garden, and all you're going to see is tall weeds and with razor sharp leaves. We see this Ephesians chapter five verse eleven, second John verses nine through eleven. We should have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. How can the child of God engage in fellowship with the child of the devil? And I'm speaking particularly about one who has given up the faith, who has had their sins remitted, who has been baptized for the remission of those sins, have them washed away in the blood of Christ, and to give up that, that form of doctrine which was and is able to save them. We have no part with them. But oftentimes we allow them to remain in our lives. What do you think they're going to do? They're going to slowly influence us to do wrong. It's the nature of sin. We as humans apparently like to uh, get as close to the edge of sin as possible without actually falling over. But you see, the battle at that point is already lost. The battle take, first takes place in our minds. If we're willing to do that, it won't be too long afterward that we'll be willing to commit that given sin. And many have fallen into that trap. Now it was mentioned a couple weeks ago, the interesting, I guess, principle that many live by is as long as I'm not alone, I can be wrong. I think the, the example given was a plane crash. Well, if I died, at least I wasn't going down alone. Well, it was, I thought it was interesting the other day one of my coworkers had mentioned something along those lines. But it seems that mankind has the inherent desire to have trust in numbers, even if they're wrong, rather than being alone and right. For some reason, we like to default to that. We trust in numbers, even if we're wrong. We know why is because if I speak up, people are going to look at me differently. People might call me names, and I don't like that. So it's a whole lot easier to kind of duck your head and go along with the rest of the herd. But you see, we're told not to follow the multitude to do evil. Exodus chapter 23, verse 2. Now that principle rings loud and clear throughout the New Testament. So rather than trusting in the flesh, we should always put our trust in Almighty God, El Shaddai. Consider his rallying command given to King Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 15 through 17. We won't read that. I'll, I'll challenge you to consider that on your own personal time. However, we will read Joshua chapter 23, verses 8 through 11. You see, this is a charge that he gave to Israel. In verse 8 there it says, But cleave unto the Lord your God, as ye have done unto this day. 
For the Lord hath driven out them from above, above, before you, the great nations and strong. But as for you, no man hath been able to stand before you unto this day. One man of you shall chase a thousand. For the Lord your God, he it is that fighteth for you, as he hath promised you. Take good heed therefore unto yourselves, that ye love the Lord your God. Now certainly that is true of us today. Now we might not be, we shouldn't be chasing off of thousands of people. But we do that spiritually speaking. Whenever we open the word of truth, whenever we attempt to attack the error that we're faced with, this is exactly what happens. God is on our side. He will win the day. People always complain about when you point out their sin, oh, you're judging me. No, I'm just reading the book. God's word says you're wrong. I'm just pointing that out. Now, God's word can also say that I am wrong. And I have the personal responsibility, the personal duty to correct those wrongs. Just as I have the same responsibility in leading those others to Christ. Now, trusting God to save us is necessary. Putting our faith in Him is a requirement. Obeying His plan for our salvation is a necessity. It's fairly simple. Hearing God's Word. How does it get any simpler than that? You must hear God's Word. It's logical. Romans 10, 17. Hearing that Word, you'll, you'll build up faith in that Word. John 8, 24. Knowing that word better is going to cause you to want to put away that old life of sin. To end those things that you were doing contrary to his will. Acts chapter 3 verse 19. Repentance. It's not just saying you're sorry. It's, although it does include being sorry. But it's much deeper than that. Having a godly sorrow. Knowing that you have disrupted your relationship with your creator. Through the actions that you've, that you've committed. Then you must confess Christ before others. Romans 10, chapter 9 and 10. And then you must finally be baptized for the remission of those sins that you have committed. Acts chapter 22, verse 16. If you've not followed those steps, why not? Why not today? If you need to study more, everyone here I know will be glad to study with you. To help you come to the proper conclusion. Now upon becoming a child of God. Holiness must be your way of life. Just as all those others who have put on Christ in baptism. It is expected of us to be holy just as God is holy. Now that's not saying we're going to be God. But obeying God gives us this holiness. Because we're separate from the world. By doing so, ultimately heaven will be your home. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 and 15. Now as humans, sometimes we do stumble. Sometimes we fall. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes we might fight the good fight of faith and we, we stumble and kind of revert back to our old ways. But that's a teaching moment. Shows you that you need more strength in that area. Now you still need to repent of that. And pray to God for your forgiveness. That's still a necessity. But don't look at every time you stumble as a complete failure. You look at history, particularly at Edison. How many times did he fail to make a light, make a light bulb? But that one time he kept pushing and kept pushing. And he eventually made light bulbs. And now we're benefiting from that light. You see, just because you sin does not mean you're eternally lost if you don't repent. Don't look at it from the standpoint of I'm a complete failure. Look at it from the standpoint of yes, I need to repent. I am lost. But look at it from the standpoint of now I know my weak point. Now I know where to work harder at. You do this in sports. Strength and conditioning, you do this in just about every aspect of life. Why not in Christianity? You know your weakness, work on those things. Now, if any of the things we talked about this morning are appealing, specific, 
specifically gaining heaven through holiness of life, through being obedient to God and His will, please make those steps to either become a Christian or to remove the sin in your life as together we stand and sing.